One prominent feature of uh, the integument of many vertebrate organisms is the presence of scales in the skin, scales in the skin. In the fossil record, the, one of the earliest evidences of scales in the skin is more of a dermal armor kind of material found in your earliest uh, jawless fishes in the fossil record. So this is uh, what we're looking at here on, on the board here is kind of the, the makeup of one of our early scale types. Uh, there's an enamel-like covering. We're going to label it enamel. On the very surface, very much like your tooth enamel. Uh, beneath that, there's a layer of material, of bony material, that's very much like your tooth material. We're going to even call it dentin. A dentin material beneath that. Then beneath that layer, spongy bone. And then below that layer, lamellar bone. So, enamel is a more dense material, uh, does not have extensions of dentinal tubules in it like dentin would have. It's very solid fossilizes pretty well. Below that you have your bony material though it's dentin, so it's the same kind of matrix material out there that you find in bone. Basic composition of it anyway is, is like that, the bone salts. But within it you find these dentinal tubules that kind of radiate out in this early example, a little different from the dentin in our tooth in that it's branching uh, tubules that go through there. Then a layer of spongy bone these little spaces here, the cavities of the spongy bone with the matrix in between those cavities in the bone, and then solid layers of bone we call lamellar bone. Okay, so the other scales that we look at that are dermal scales are going to be variations on this pattern right here. So next we're going to look at the other kinds of scales we see in modern fish. Nothing today has a scale that looks like this. It has this uh, complex arrangement of multiple layers, enamel, dentin, spongy bone, and lamellar bone. Everything else has a, a less. Every, all the modern fish have less. Uh, they might have some of their components, but not all four of these. Now the scales of some other fish types. We started with that basic scale arrangement with an enamel layer, then dentin, then a spongy bone, and then lamellar bone. None of these show the spongy bone composition. The first one is from the chondrichthyan fish, the sharks and their relatives. It includes the enamel layer on the top, then a layer of dentin material, then around the from that, let's see, around the edges of that, kind of forming a base ring at the base of the scale, we have lamellar bone. And this usually forms like a little point. If you feel the skin of a shark or uh, some of the other chondrichthyan fish, they'll, they're very um, rough kind of like sandpaper surface. So anyway, in the middle of this there is a pulp cavity. So this is very much like a tooth. To us we have enamel and dentin forming our tooth and then in the middle is a pulp cavity. Uh, we don't have the lamellar bone as the base for that. But anyway, uh, this type of tooth is sometimes referred to as a placoid, not tooth, type of scale is called a placoid scale. Placoid scale. Sometimes it's referred to as a denticle. It's kind of like a tubercle that's a tooth. It's a denticle. <laughs>
So if you'll think of it in terms of your phylogenetic chart for above your agnathans and that initial scale we talked about before was agnathan type. So the first extension above that in the phylogenetic chart would have been the chondrichthyan fish. So here's a modification of that scale type in the chondrichthyan fish. In both the uh, coelacanth and the polypterid fish, we have this next scale type that has enamel and dentin and lamellar bone. But it's more of a sandwich type thing, doesn't stick up like a tooth like it does on the uh, shark. Now their teeth would still be tooth-like, more like our teeth. So we have the, we didn't have that kind of arrangement in the jawless fish. They didn't have teeth with enamel and dentin and all that. But anyway, and this is referred to as a ganoid scale. That material on the top is referred to as ganoin. I think there's an e on the end of it. Anyway, ganoin, and it's called a ganoid scale. It's a special uh, variation of enamel, maybe. It's basically the same stuff as the enamel material, but they call it ganoin on these scales. Oh, well, let's see. That's, like I said, polypterids and the uh, coelacanth. <coughs> Excuse me. They say... <coughs> that that dentin layer is reduced in the coelacanth. It's not as thick as it is in the polypterids. But anyway, next is the gar, garfish. Has the enamel layer. Has lamellar bone. That surface material here is still usually referred to as a ganoin material, so it's the same sort. And then most of the rest of the fish, all of the teleos fish that have scales and so on, are this last type, where we have lamellar bone. It's not really lamellar bone. It's a layer of bone matrix without cells in it, so it's not a complete bone layer. It's not, there are no bone cells in that layer, but it's made of bone material. Don't know quite how to say that. Layer of bone material, I guess. But it's not like bone tissue. And then on top of that, we have a layer of collagen. Makes up the scale. And most of our fish, like a carp or a bass or whatever would have a scale this time. So we can see there's a reduction in the material as you run from the more primitive types to the more advanced types of fish. First you lose the spongy bone, then you start to lose the uh, dentin layer, then your your lamellar bone is essentially gone. You just you don't have any bone cells in it, but you have that solid layer with collagen associated with it. So that's kind of a progression that you see as you run from more primitive forms of fish to more advanced forms. Now this basic arrangement here, um, well, even thinking back to the, the uh, earlier scale type, is incorporated into the head skeleton as a part of the skull, what we call dermal bone. You don't see it in the sharks, but once you get into polypterids, uh, all the lungfish and, and the other fish there, the gar and the bowfin show this a lot. Their head skeleton is essentially scales. The outer part, the dermal skeleton in the head is scales. So I'm going to show you a, a couple of uh, examples of skulls that show that feature. Okay, here's the skull of a bowfin, uh, uh, genus Amia. It's related closely to the gar. We'll look at a gar here in a second. But you can see that when you look at the skull of 
a bow fan, its entire head looks like it's pretty complete there. It just looks kind of like, almost like the fish did in real life. You just put a thin layer of skin tissue over that and you have the head. So the scales of the head here are just sunken beneath the, the skin just a bit. And uh, basically what you see here are the scales for the head, for the head region. So uh, anyway, this is, this is bone material thought to be derived basically from scales that uh, had formed in some ancestral type of organism. So this is thought to be a derivative of that early scale type, the dermal bone of the head. You can see the scaly nature even more so on the side of a gar skull right here. I don't know how well that shows up in the picture, but anyways, tiny little scales right here on the side of the, of the gar head, larger plates on the top and on the gill there. But anyway, that pattern of scales you can see real well on the side of a gar. There, now you can see it a little better. Okay, we've been talking about different kinds of fish scales, and fish scales are dermal scales in the dermis of the skin. We're going to transition to epidermal scales here in a minute, but first of all, before we leave the uh, dermal scales, uh, when, when you get past the fish in the phylogenetic chart and into the amphibians, most of the amphibians we have around today do not have any dermal scales at all, and they, do, of course, don't have epidermal scales either. So they don't have any dermal scales with the exception of the Caecilians. In the Caecilians, underneath the epidermis, down in the dermis, there's still a, a, a remnant of that dermal scale structure in a Caecilian, but you don't see it in frogs, toads, and salamanders, only a, a, a trace of it in the Caecilians, some dermal elements there. And where they occur down in the skin, a uh, dermal scale, is called an osteoderm. Now, I mentioned that they're present in Caecilians. Once you get beyond the amphibians, there's still some presence of osteoderms in reptiles. Um, in the uh, plates of the uh, back of uh, underneath the the epidermal scales of a crocodilian and some lizards along the back. Underneath the epidermal scales in the dermis, there's another scale in the dermis, and they refer to those as osteoderms. They are dermal scales, not epidermal scales. Uh, so we see them in crocodilians, we see them in lizards. Most of a turtle's shell is osteoderm with a layer of epidermal scales on the top. So while you see the uh, epidermal scales on the outside, just underneath of that a very thin layer of epidermal scale, there's a much heavier and thicker dermal layer of material. It's bone material uh, in there, but anyway, it's the osteoderm. Oh, uh, let's see. Present to some extent still in uh, possibly the uh, armadillo Armadillos have epidermal scales on the outside and then underneath of those epidermal scales there's still some bony material in the dermis and those can be thought of as osteoderms. Are they homologous to what you see in a crocodilian? I'm not sure, uh, but anyway. Transitioning then to epidermal scales, remember we don't see them in fish, we don't see them in amphibians, no epidermal scales, first time you see them is in the reptilia. Uh, the way these scales grow, it's a little bit like what we saw with the development of the hair or nail uh, in the skin. So anyway, there's a, a layer between the epidermis and the dermis that's irregular, and where we have these irregularities, these scales will develop. Within the skin, it's kind of like has, having a matrix 
material that grows the uh, scale up and out of the skin here. So anyway, it's growing from tissues underneath part of that epidermis, contributes to the scale as it hardens and uh, cornifies, becomes highly keratinized. There's still an epidermis layer in between these scales that are forming in the skin. So anyhow, you've got this continuous layer. In some reptiles, they overlap quite a bit. In some reptiles, there's a lot of skin between individual scales. In some places, it'll vary on the body from one place to another, where you'll have more skin and fewer scales, or completely covered with scales. I'm going to show you a turtle shell now, this turtle common uh, eastern box turtle shell. Only one epidermal scale is left on this shell right here. The rest of this is all dermal scale and you can see the shape of each scale in the uh, shell in there. So that's all bony material, bony material formed in the dermis of the skin. Dermal bone. Here's another example of a turtle, and you can see some of the material of the epidermal scale coming off of the dermal uh, material underneath of it here. So this is an epidermal scale. It's about the thickness of uh, apple skin or something like that. Not very thick layer of epidermal scale overlying that dermal material on the uh, turtle shell. Scales, we see on the turtle shell, the epidermal scales on the outside, they're on almost all reptiles. The only reptile I can think of that doesn't have an abundance of epidermal scales would be the soft shell turtle. Um, lizards, snakes, all these other things, they have a good layer of scale covering on the body. Um, birds have scales on their legs and feet. You don't see them on most of the body. It's covered with feathers and of course there's the beak. Uh, but on the legs and on the feet, you have these scales. In mammals, um, not many mammals exhibit scales, uh, but a few uh, have them fairly prominently. The pangolin is the most obvious example. It's got large uh, epidermal scales covering the entire body. And uh, the armadillo also has epidermal scales on the body, but it has some dermal scale underneath of that. So anyway, epidermal scales are found pretty much through all of the amniote groups. The reptiles, birds, and mammals uh, have examples that have epidermal scales. Now our next topic has to do with different kinds of horns you find on animals. We're going to look at four examples here that are found on mammals. Uh, you may find horns on some lizards and uh, birds as well and they're always just a modified scale or part of the beak uh, in birds that sticks off the top of the head. A cornified structure made of keratin uh, that extends out. Um, now looking at these horns here. First example here is what we often refer to as true horn. This would be what you would see on Cattle, uh, antelopes, sheep and goats, all of those have this kind of horn. Uh, the characteristics of true horn, the outside of it here is made of this thick, cornified horn layer. So we have the outer cornified layer underneath of that is the epidermis that produced that cornified or keratinized layer. I have it in orange here, maybe kind of hard to see. Then there's a red line that represents the dermis of the skin. And then finally here in black we have bone. So there's a core of bone in the base of the horn, then the dermal tissue, the dermis, overlies that bone, and then the epidermal layer that produces the cornified tissue 
on the outside. I have a cow horn right here and uh, the center of it is filled with bone and there's a slight gap in here where the uh, dermis and some of the epidermis has disappeared, rotted away over the years and then the outer thick layers of that cornified material, the outer horn material, that's as hard as bone. It's really hard material. So anyway, that's true horn. Um, it's always, with one exception, it's always just an unbranched structure, a single structure. So in your antelopes, all of your sheep and goats, all your cattle, bison, they all have this kind of a horn and it is not branched. The only th uh, example of a true horn that has a branch is what we call a prong horn, which has just one little spur off the main uh, horn in a prong horn antelope. The next type of horn is a giraffe horn. In the giraffe horn, we have the bone core, the black in the middle. We have a dermis and epidermis, and on the outside we have hair. Instead of having a cornified exterior, like the horn material, it's just hair on the outside. And in a giraffe, it just stays like this. It's just a core of bone, epidermis and dermis, and hair. Nothing really unusual about that, except for this little blunt spike that sticks up off the top of a giraffe's head. Um, let's see, next, very much like the giraffe horn, is the antler. So this is antler down here. An antler grows up as bone from the, from the skull and starts to branch usually. So you might have a lot of branches like in an elk or a reindeer kind of arrangement. But uh, moose would be the same sort of thing. And of course our, our common white-tailed deer have this kind of a structure. It starts out the same as a giraffe horn. It's covered, that bone grows up, and as it grows, it's covered with a an dermis and epidermis and hair. Okay? That outer hair that comes off of the antler is referred to as velvet. The velvet. So after the horn grows all the way up, all the antler grows all the way up and out and finishes growing, it then loses the blood supply that keeps the epidermis and dermis and hair components all going. So as it kind of dies out, it gets rubbed off the uh, deer or moose or whatever, will rub its antlers on brush and, and trees and things to try to remove that old dead material that's on the outside of that bony horn. And you're left with just a single bony horn uh, and its branches in the end. So a giraffe has basically got an antler that never loses its velvet and tissues on the outside. The last example is a rhinoceros horn and it is not like the others at all. There's no core of bone, there's no epidermis and dermis growing up into the bone, and uh, the whole thing is made out of hair. This is a hair horn on a rhinoceros, okay? So we have true horn in the cattle, we have the giraffe horn in the giraffe, we have antlers in all the deer group, uh, and then we have the hair horn in a rhinoceros. Okay, we're going to go down a list now of special keratinized structures of the skin. So. We know that our outer epidermis is keratinized. It's that dry uh, but somewhat tough and resilient protein material that uh, forms the outer layers of our uh, epithelium on our skin. So in addition to that kind of material, we have other structures that develop from keratinized tissues in the epidermis. Uh, the first one to mention is lamprey teeth. Lamprey teeth. So the teeth around the opening of the disc of the lamprey are made out of keratin. They do not have enamel teeth with dentin in them. So that's the, one of the first places we see any kind of keratinized structure. 
Uh, we really don't see much more as we go through the, the fish all the way to the amphibians. Some of the amphibians start to show the kind of keratinization in the epidermal, the outer epidermal layers that we have in our skin. So some, many of them do not. Most frogs and salamanders do not have a keratinized or a well keratinized epidermis of their skin. But some like the common garden toad that have the drier, rougher kind of skin will, will have some keratinization there. But anyway, finally in the um, uh, reptiles, you start to see epidermal scales, intensely hard uh, epidermal structures there, the keratinized structures, and they also have claws. So epidermal scales and claws you see here for the first time. Um, some of the uh, lizards have kind of spike-like scales on them, and, and uh, a couple of them have a modified horn-like structure on their uh, snout. Beaks. Turtles have beaks. So do birds, right? But uh, turtles have beaks. So when we're in the reptiles, thinking of reptiles, reptiles, some of them have beaks, the turtles. When you get beyond that, uh, thinking about birds, the feathers. Feathers are special cornified structures. There, I can't think of any other additional things other than the kind of horn that forms on the beak of like a hornbill. Uh, but uh, next would be in the mammals, we have hair, we have nails. That's basically what we have as humans. Then uh, some animals have hooves instead of nails. It's a different kind of structure. Horn, we've talked about already. Uh, it forms like a true horn of cattle and sheep and goats and antelopes. Tori, the thick pads that you have on the bottoms of the feet of say most, most carnivores, your dogs and cats, bears and raccoons, things like that. They have a much thicker a bottom to their foot than what we would normally have. That extra thick keratinized epidermis, they can refer to that as tori, those toe pads and foot pads on those animals. And finally, the last thing on here, baleen is probably the most unusual example in the list. In baleen whales, there are two kinds of whales, toothed whales and baleen whales. In the baleen whales, they produce along their, their jawline large plates of keratin, thin, long plates of keratin with a, a gap between. And they filter feed in the ocean and they take in a big mouthful of water and whatever food might be in it. And then they filter the water out through that, that baleen like a sieve. And the food particles stay to the inside of that screen of baleen and go down into their gut and the water goes out. So it's part of their filter feeding mechanism, that baleen.